and uh, this is going to be. Oh yes, okay, sorry. Welcome. Uh, this is uh, going to be an action-packed panel uh, with lots of great ideas and discussions. We want to spark your imaginations about what might be possible. Point to uh, you know uh, gaps that we see and uh, generate discussion. So we want to know kind of what is happening across the country based on the different sp safe spaces that we're aware of. So this panel is really going to give you a sense of some of the different models that exist, the kinds of challenges that they are experiencing, some of which will be of no surprise to anyone, um, but also how they're shifting their shelter models to fit the needs of communities, changing the culture around ageism, how to address that in order to support uh, prevention, and, uh, you know, the need for culturally sensitive and increased uh, linguistic challenges that, that, you know, people may be facing. So it is going to be um, a good hour together. I'm really looking forward to it. And so I'm going to start with uh, Marianne, and Marianne's really going to start by describing describe your shelter the model the role that you're filling the kinds of limitations maybe the number of people that you're serving are you urban are you rural those kinds of introduce us to yourselves thank you hi everyone welcome it's i'm coming to you from beautiful calgary alberta um it rained overnight but it's looking good out there so far today um, I just wanted to share with you about our um, elder abuse shelter that we have in Calgary. Of course, it's rural. Um, I have a bit of a PowerPoint here just to kind of see, so you can see what our rooms look like. So for us, 55 plus and clients have to be actively fleeing elder abuse. Um, we have 14 funded beds in this beautiful shelter that hopefully you can all see right now. Um, we are fully funded and we, um, are always full. So what does that tell you? It tells you that obviously there's a need, um, for a shelter for older adults escaping abuse and that requirement for, um, assistance and help so that they can move out into the community and live successfully, um, in the community. So we have weekly case management at our shelter with social workers. So people um, look at sometimes it's base. We're going right back to the basics around um, getting ID, getting Alberta healthcare card before we can even look at housing options to fill out the forms and um, and get seniors housed in the community. One of the struggles that we face is that, like a lot of places in Canada, or probably most places, is that there's a shouting, uh, housing shortage. And so we um, are having difficulties placing our seniors in the area because of housing not being available, housing costing too much money, that type of thing. So normally we are 90 day shelter um, but with the new struggles nowadays, we're looking at sometimes six, seven, eight months of individuals in shelter. Last year, we had 37 admissions for the year. We turned away 82 due to capacity. Um, there was probably around 300 that we turned away due to didn't meet mandate um, or individuals that um, we didn't have the resources to support, so that type of thing. Our average age is 66 years of age. And one of the questions that we were talking about is whether, um, you know, our population really reflects the population of um, Calgary and Alberta. For us, we have about 16% of Indigenous clients accessing the shelter. And our, I think it's 1.9% of Indigenous 2.9%, sorry, of Indigenous folk that um, make up the greater Calgary area. Longer stays, like I, like I just finished saying, and clients primarily come to us from within Calgary. However, we do have clients that come from rural Alberta. We have clients come from BC, from Ontario, from other provinces, just due to the fact that 
um, there is limited elder abuse shelters in Canada. Alberta is doing a pretty good. Um, we we have we're doing a pretty good job in terms of elder abuse. We have a shelter here in Calgary, and we also have one in Edmonton. And you know, even further to that, we're looking working with the government right now to develop safe spaces for rural and indigenous communities in in Alberta. So what that means is we're trying to partner with nursing homes or other long-term care senior centers in those rural and indigenous communities to secure maybe one bed um, so that individuals don't have to come to the, to the urban centers for that type of support. Um, you know, when we talk about our limitations and challenges, our shelter, um, does not have the capacity to work with individuals that have high medical needs or don't have a level of independence where they can make their own food, um, take care of themselves in their own room, access supports independently in the community. Um, sometimes we partner with home care, but sometimes that independence piece, we, we don't we don't have those supports. We don't have healthcare aides. We don't have doctors or nurses or mental health um, professionals to help us within the shelter. So what we do is we make partners and relationships with people out in the community so that we can access that. But in right in shelter, we don't have those supports at this time. Substance use is another one. So we wanna, you know, for all of our seniors to be able to be safe and secure. Um, we do not have the ability to work with those individuals that have, you know, substance use and that is affecting their goals and their day to day. Um, and then, of course, the last one here is housing crisis and cost of living. I'm also making sure that I'm checking my time here because I know we don't, we all don't have lots of time. Um, in terms of our strengths, we have for up to one year after people leave shelter um, at Unison. Um, we have two social workers that will work specifically with clients in the community to maintain their success. So, and it was interesting because I had a, a large get together through accreditation probably a couple of weeks ago. And we had a number of past outreach clients that came to join the celebration and the number, and I know this is anecdotal, but a number of clients and just the vibe of, you know what, Marianne, we were at the shelter and then kind of out in the community and somewhat lost in a way. And so that partnership and that being able to have those, that past for one year post shelter that they can have somebody that they can call, that they can get assistance from, get resources from, um, has helped them immensely to not return back to shelters, to not return back to um, homelessness, right? So that's super important. I was very um, excited to hear a lot of those stories and whatnot from, from our seniors to know that the service is, is doing well. And I do have a story, but I think what I'm going to do is um, I want to make sure everybody else has time to um, explain their shelter. And then maybe we can go in some of those other stories afterwards if we have time. And if anybody okay. has questions, there's my there's my information. Thanks, Thanks Marianne. Margaret. I, I don't want to forget about the story, so so we'll come back to it. And so uh, does one of the other panelists want to volunteer to go next? Or I'll randomly select. Go ahead, Carly. I can go. Hi, everybody. I'm Carly Grant. I'm the Senior Programs Manager with Victoria Women's Transition House. And we are located on the Wasonic, Esquimalt, and Songhe Nations, colonially known as Victoria. And today I'm going to talk about two of our programs that we offer that are specifically for older adults. Our first one is our safe home. 
And our safe home provides emergency shelter for individuals 50 plus that are being intimate partner violence. Um, and our secondary mandate is those that are fleeing abuse from their adult children, recognizing that there's uh, sort of that intergenerational component to abuse. Now, within our agency, we currently only have one space, which is a little bit shocking given the size of our location. Luckily, we are moving to have two more additional safe home spaces opening in the fall. So I'm very excited to be able to offer that. So what this space offers is instead of an individual 50 plus staying within our emergency shelter for 30 days, we provide them with a space that is of um, more independence, um, more uh, a, a space where they can be by themselves, knowing that a shelter space can be overwhelming with children running around, that there might be additional needs around privacy if they're, they do come with home care supports that they need for aids to daily living, um, but also allow them additional shelter is a maximum 30 day stay because our purpose is to um, support those fleeing violence and the highest risk state is within that 30 days but we recognize that individuals that are 50 plus may have more complex needs that we have to address and provide more time it might be harder to get back into the workforce there might be more financial needs we see a lot of individuals who own property therefore aren't eligible for certain housing but that's being used as financial abuse by their um, abusive partners. So we do provide up to 60 days stay in this space. We do The space does have to allow for individuals who are not being actively sought. So um, the, the risk, risk level of that, the violence has to be lowered. Um, with this, we're currently this past year, we only provided um, safe spaces to six individuals because we were at capacity and turned away 11 individuals. So that's really showing the need of that space. Some of the reasons we've had to turn around away individuals from that program was that around that healthcare needs and the higher level of healthcare needs that we can't support or accessibility, the building that this is uh, location is housed in isn't quite um, as accessible as we would like. So that creates an additional barrier. Um, our new location that will have two additional safe homes does have an accessible unit. So we're very excited to be able to provide that opportunity to those fleeing violence. Um, the second space is actually a transitional housing unit that is up to two years for individuals fleeing intimate partners um, and provides them a one bedroom unit uh, that they can rent at rent geared to income. Um, for up to two years while they build and regain independence, both financially and within their goals and go through healing. Um, now, we last year we served 29 individuals through that program. And unfortunately, we still have a wait list. So there's not enough spaces for that specific population that we're serving. Um, and unfortunately in our safe home, only about 50% of the individuals we served last year actually found permanent housing. The rest we had to transition into a different shelter or temporary housing, which is very unfortunate, but the, as um, I'm sure everybody on this panel will note is the cost of living right now is so high that there's even with subsidies, in, many individuals cannot even afford to pay rent. Um, and never mind the lack of actual accessible and um, safe housing for the individuals we serve. Um, the question around if it reflects the diversity of the local population, I think we don't have enough spaces to be able to represent the diversity of the population. We are finding we are serving a lot more um, newcomers to Canada or those seeking refugees um, status. And so we have had to adapt uh, how we provide support and are providing uh, translation services so that we can provide um, full support and help people transition and work through the system of gaining independence and finding housing while they are here with us. Uh, the strengths of our model is that we do have some ability to adapt. So the one program for our Thursday transitional housing has previously been sort of high threshold ceiling of age 65 as our top age, but we've been actually adjusting that given the need and the applicants we're seeing, we're seeing that that is moving upwards, that 
70s are looking to flee violence um, and looking for a safe space. So we are adjusting our mandate to be able to um, meet the needs of the community. Um, so that's a great strength of our program. Um, and I think with the program, it's just like many, many people on this panel will probably say is a lack of resources and funds to be able to continue to support and actually meet the needs of the community. We are constantly running wait lists. We are always um, trying to find creative solutions to get people into housing to, um, to continue to heal, but that's not always the case. Unfortunately, we're in a situation that there's a lot of barriers to these individuals moving through sort of that transitional process of housing. So. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Carly. Lisa, I'm going to come to you next. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Mendel, and I work at Family Service Toronto in Toronto, Ontario. And I, um, we operate as um, elder abuse or an elder shelter. I'm sorry, uh, called Pat's Place. Just to give you a little bit of background, because sometimes people wonder why the name. So Pat, uh, Pat's Place is named after a former manager at Family Service Toronto, who was instrumental in working with the Mayor's Committee uh, in 1984 and onwards in Toronto to recognize that elder abuse was an issue. And so we wanted to honor her name, and that's why it is named Pat's Place. It was also a good, good name because it was a bit generic, we thought. Um, I'd love to tell you that Pat Space is big and has lots of beds and all that jazz, but it does not. We rent a one-bedroom apartment in a confidential location in Toronto where one person or a couple, because it's a one-bedroom, can move for up to 60 days rent-free to be able to get away from an abusive situation to think about what they want to do. We do safety planning with people. We engage them in counseling supports if they wish to be engaged in counseling supports. Not all people will make use of that. We really work to help them slow down the situation that they've found themselves in and to get that time away. Of course, Toronto is a very uh, urban environment and the people that we work with uh, reflect the, a full range of diversity. We have both men and women accessing Pat's Place who are experiencing abuse uh, from their spouse or partners and or their adult children. We're also very proud of the fact that Pat's Place is pet friendly. So if someone has a pet, they can bring it. And the landlord uh, has a pet friendly um, policy. Obviously the cat or dog, <laughs> I guess let's put it out needs to be um, under the contr control of the owner in public spaces. But that's been a real bonus because we know that people make decisions to stay, stay in the abusive situation that they're living in because they don't know what will happen to their pet. So that's one thing that we're very proud of. Pat's Place opened in September 2008 and it, we were approached by a member of the Rotary Club of Toronto who actually was in the business of, had a uh, business providing support workers on a private for pay basis to, to individuals and knew that there was a group of individuals in the community that couldn't pay for those services and or were not eligible through the public system here in Ontario. And so really came to us saying, and knew that abuse was occurring, and really came to us and said, what would it take to purpose build a shelter in Toronto for older people experiencing abuse? And we sort of took a big gulp and said, we don't think it, we're ready for that yet. We're not an organization that does bricks and mortars. As we say, we provide um, supports within the context of housing and other things. But this person stuck with us and managed to secure at that time $35,000 in funding to span across two years for us to open Pat's Place, which meant a very large shopping trip to several stores in Toronto to buy everything we needed to equip the unit. And I tell you that story because it has been a shoestring ever since. We've never, unfortunately, been able to secure funding for Pat's Place, despite trying. 
Um, and so I'm very fortunate that I work in an organization that saw the benefit of it and has been uh, through various means were able to pay the rent each month um, for, for Pat's Place. The staffing resource supports that we put into Pat's Place come from our seniors team that um, does a lot of work around uh, working with seniors who are experiencing abuse. People can stay at Pat's Place for up to 60 days. We cannot afford for people to stay beyond that time because we are the leaseholder on the unit. And it makes it very difficult if someone doesn't leave because the longer they stay, the longer the potential is they're not going to leave, unfortunately, and we're going to be left holding a lease that can get really quite mucky. Um, of course, if someone has a place to go and needs another week or two, and we're, we're happy to extend our stay, but we're not, we, we cannot extend the stay past 60 days, which makes for some difficult um decisions that have to be made to support and but also some really great support that comes from the folks that we work with in the community um so that's and that is one of the successes i wanted to talk about past place couldn't work if we did not have strong partnerships with the organizations that refer people to come to live at past place so Pat's Place is a planned move. It's not a situation where someone can come in the middle of the night. We don't have housing and we don't have staffing, uh, but it's a planned move. And so we work with community partners who might be working with an older person who is experiencing abuse. And we work together with them to support someone to move into Pat's Place. So if you can do the math, if you can stay for up to 60 days, we have provisions to have about six people a year move in and out of Pat's place. And we probably have at any one time, four times that number of people for every you know, two month rotation, we've got you know, four people trying to, to move into Pat's place. We don't get a lot of information about the disposition of the people who can't move to Pat's place because they have to move on to look for something else, which is a difficult situation. But that, the, the fact that we do have partners uh, who are willing, and many, you may, you may know this business, many people work in catchment areas, but they're willing to step outside of their catchment area to be able to support the client that they're working with to move to our location, which might not be in the area that they generally work in. So we've developed good and strong relationships with a lot of providers and are always open to, to new folks coming to, uh, to talk to us about Pat's Place. The different supports that we offer, I already mentioned a few of them, is sort of safety planning around um, both being safe moving to, being at, and leaving Pat's Place. We will offer people counseling supports if they are interested. Um, we do provide people with um, referrals and helping them lead directly to a range of community resources. And that's done in collaboration often with the organization that's supporting them. And we start from day one or as soon as a person will allow us into their lives. And I'll talk a little bit about that by developing a plan for them, you know, to what they're going to do uh, in the future when they leave Pat's place. And going back, it was very interesting because when we set up Pat's Place, we were all like gung-ho, we'll be there holding your hand from day one, even before you walk across the threshold. And what we've learned repeatedly in the almost 20 years we've been operating Pat's Place um, is that people don't want us in their lives when they first get to Pat's Place. They want that time to settle, to close the door, to be able to take control over their location, to do a little exploring in the community that they now find themselves living in. So that's been an interesting and key learning for us is that we, we don't sit back and wait forever, but we do you know, really create that space. And again, that's about creating that, that um, sense of safety for individuals. So I think that's about all I have right now about Pat's Place. We'll come back to some storytelling I hear, Margaret. So I'll turn it over to the next person. That's great. Thanks so much, Lisa. And so Tiffany, I'll come to you. Absolutely. I'm going to share my PowerPoint here. Oh, 
All right. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yep. Wonderful. So I'm Tiffany Pass. I'm the team lead of social work here at A and O Support Services for Older Adults, formerly known as Age and Opportunity. So at our agency, we support older adults 55 plus living in community. And one of the programs we offer is called our Safe Suite program. So this program is safe housing for individuals 55 plus living in the community, regardless of gender. We're able to help both one person or couples in our suites. Our safe suites are furnished accommodations where clients can stay there for up to 60 days free of charge. We do offer a bit of a longer accommodation if needed. Right now, we're seeing about an average stay of 70 days. As everyone else has mentioned right now, one of those challenges is the housing crisis across Canada. So our safe suite has two locations in the city that are in apartments 55 plus. Nobody knows where those locations are until you're working with the clients. So we do our best to ensure that they are kept confidential at all times. To date, we've had 92 occupants in our suites. So because our safe suite only has two locations, there's always someone waiting to go into that suite. Uh, we do our best on our intake process to ensure we're targeting the right audience, but that can be challenging. So how does it work? How do you get into our safe suite program? So clients can self-refer or another person can refer a client on their behalf. They'll go through an in-depth intake assessment uh, with our intake worker and then with two social workers to ensure that this is a good fit for them. When clients are in our safe suite, they need to be in imminent danger. So they need to leave their situation immediately for fear of their life. Um, with that, we do not work 24 seven. So we're only staff Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. So if a situation arose on a weekend, we wouldn't be able to get to those people until Monday. In this week, clients must live independently. So they must be able to cook and clean for themselves and do some light housekeeping. As I mentioned, because we only work Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, our suites aren't monitored. So we wanna make sure that clients are gonna be safe in those suites. And maybe that's you know, working with other organizations to ensure that they will be uh, safe in our safe suites. Who can access our suites? So anyone across Manitoba can access our suites. I think it's really important to be able to hit such a broad population because if you think of someone on a reserve, where would they go safely to hide from their alleged abuser? If they're gonna stay with a relative or friend, it could be possible that you know the alleged abuser knows where they're going. So we've worked with many people across the province, you know, working on getting them train tickets or bus tickets to get into our suite. When in our suites, clients work with a registered social worker to provide intense counseling services and safety planning. So we really want to make sure that clients have the time to come up with a safe plan for when they leave the suites. We do our best to offer the counseling service. We don't force anyone into counseling if they're not ready for that, but that support is there if they choose to accept it. We also provide practical assistance. So that could be arranging financial support such as financial community counseling, um, finding them housing, maybe working through the legal system. Our social workers at a &O are all protection order designates. So we are able to help clients uh, apply for a protection order as well. And any other support that might be needed, such as accessing a health card as well. When in our safe suite, we have a partnership with our Winnipeg police. So police are notified when an individual um, enters our suite. We do that so that if the alleged abuser calls the police saying that this person is missing, they are aware that they are in our suite and are actually not a missing person. Um, so that doesn't go out. We work with our Winnipeg Regional Health Authority as well 
to ensure that clients are able to live independently. So maybe that's setting up some home care to continue to live independently. Uh, maybe when they came into our safe suite, they were reliant upon the alleged abuser to help with medications or bathing. So we wanna make sure we can keep them safe and living independently. All our suites are also equipped with a Victoria Lifeline. So clients are able to wear a lifeline and if they do have a fall, they're able to press that to receive immediate help as well. Uh, like I said, we make referrals to Winnipeg police, hospitals if needed, and other abuse shelters. Since we do only have the two locations in Winnipeg, sometimes we have to work with other shelters in the city to ensure clients can leave that abusive situation. Um, some of the challenges we have is, like I just mentioned, the demand of our safe suite. Since we only have two, sometimes we have to get creative and find other accommodations for the time being until we can move them into our safe suite. Um, we've been able to work with local hotels before to make those accommodations if possible. Another challenge is finding accommodations for clients after they leave the safe suite. Like Lisa had mentioned just earlier, you know, finances are hard. Housing is really high right now. And just the shortage in Manitoba is, is crazy. It's really hard to find someone a safe space to go after. Another challenge we run into with our safe suite is how are we going to get those clients' belongings from possibly the alleged abuser's house? Um, you know, our Winnipeg police are very busy, so we might not be able to rely on them to help us with that. So how can we get their stuff so that they can live comfortably in their new place with their own bed and their favorite chair? Um, so really working with clients in that way. Some gray areas also can be a challenge, like what if clients don't fit into our services particularly, but need additional support? So what happens if they come to us um, with addiction problems? They wouldn't be granted access to our safe suite at the time, but how can we ensure they're, they're being safe and where can we help them get additional support? I think some of the success in our safe suite is, you know, we allow clients to have that time to breathe for a second. They get at least a week before we start, you know, working with them more in depth to just take a second, breathe, relax, and feel safe again. They get the time to explore their surroundings and really get time to know the neighborhood that they're in now. And because they're going into a block that's 55 plus, we've noticed a lot of our clients are able to make friends in the building, which is really nice. Or if they're not social in that way, but they're wanting social engagement, maybe we connect them with one of our other programs at the agency like Senior Center Without Walls so that they can have those friendly conversations safely in their own home. And I think that's it. I definitely have stories for later, Margaret, but I'll share those when that time comes. Okay, thanks, Tiffany. And Mohammed, you are next. Please do introduce yourself and tell us all about your work in your safe space. I'm happy to share my PowerPoint. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Abdullah, and I am the founder and executive director at Connections for Seniors. Um, we were established in 2018 with a mandate to empower seniors to overcome barriers to safe and affordable housing and provide support services that help reduce risk to well-being and promote quality of life. We believe that all seniors have the right to feel safe, to feel healthy, and to make choices about their own lives. I feel like I can do better with that slide. Just one. I'm trying to make it just full of screen. We were established in January 2018, um, and our emergency uh, accommodation um, was attached to case management and other services for older adults of 55 plus that are facing homelessness. 
um, we started with the vision of having uh, different programs. This is just an oversight of the programs that we are currently providing. Um, but when we first started, the only program that we started was a shelter program. We, uh, we have uh, four adjacent homes or houses uh, located in downtown St. John's area, uh, can accommodate uh, 16 individuals. Uh, we started with four beds in 2018, uh, and then we doubled that in 2019, then we tripled that in 2019 as well. So within two years, uh, we moved from four to 12, and then uh, two years after, we, became, we, we have 16 individual uh, rooms uh, for, for older adults to reside there. Um, it's close to amenities and a lot of services downtown, so it's very convenient to stay. Um, the home uh, has only four people uh, uh, at capacity, and then every other home has uh, four people. They have their own common area, they receive their meals, and they have a large dining area there. Um, they have access to uh, entertainment and TV and computers uh, in the common areas. Um, of course, the shelter is staffed with support, uh, case managers and social workers uh, in the daytime and support workers uh, around the clock 24 seven. Uh, and there's uh, the basic need of like housekeeping and uh, other needs that seniors might need staying in a shelter uh, they'll be receiving. Um, Th this month, uh, last year, we were approved for 35 individual beds to expand our shelter as uh, our case managers in the community and the outreach program are working with seniors around uh, the city in multiple shelters. So we thought about bringing uh, um, seniors in one place uh, under 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 the uh, expansion of the shelter program. Um, this is a historical house uh, in, in downtown area too. It's about two minutes away from the current shelter, but the idea is that it's going to be a housing center uh, for seniors. Um, it will have drop-in services and more housing services in place for seniors uh, when they are in need of support. Um, and instead of moving from a place to another around the city to access services, we're trying to centralize uh, the housing services for seniors in one place. Um, this is meant to be for short-term stay only. Um, from one to three months. After one month, there will be different uh, approaches in, in why there is no solutions. Um, and then after three months, it will be the, it will be considered a transitional housing needs if the need is not related to the shortage of housing in the community. Um, after COVID, we are seeing a big shortage in the housing market. Um, um, we're seeing a lot of seniors that are uh, trying to access uh, safe housing, but they are not uh, able to do so uh, due to the cost of living and the increased cost of living. Um, the, 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 current, the current shelter space is supposed to start operation in about three weeks um, um, and will have uh, more intensive case managers uh, management on site. Um, we usually have about 15 per case load and we're going to Increase that to about eight uh, per case load. So we're going to increase the capacity of case management in order to support uh, seniors in our community. We're fully funded by our provincial government. Um, so there's a lot of work that we're trying to bring uh, up to speed here with the need that has been happening since COVID. Uh, our case management program is a wraparound service, it's housing first approach. But we have a housing team that is focused on that, but it's overlapping with our health and community. Uh, we don't separate them, but we separate them on our end, but we don't uh, ignore it when seniors are staying in, in, our, in our shelter. Uh, we try to uh, look at older needs uh, and try to meet them, but uh, housing is a focus when they are staying in the shelter and they can be referred to some of our uh, other programs uh, that we're operating. Uh, we work, uh, a lot of seniors come through our door, don't have ID, uh, uh, don't have a family doctor. Um, um, the story I'm going to be mentioning after for actually a specific uh, situation of a senior that um, was being evicted due to health concerns, but it was perceived as a behavior issue uh, um, um, until uh, two years after we, when we started, we met him. He was one of the first people that came through our door. Um, 
and everything got situated within four months when we discovered what's going on. Uh, but having that scope of like um, holistic scope of approaching seniors' needs and looking at all the needs equally, uh, it helps us to uh, figure out what what the housing problem is um, in the first place. We receive. Excuse me. Uh, our main referral agency is uh, Newfoundland Labrador Housing. They are the, the government department that oversee emergency housing uh, and approve uh, shelters for individuals to stay uh, in shelters. Um, and we fall under that as well. But we also work uh, with, um, uh, now the number is a little bit bigger than that, but on average about, uh, uh, I think, 30 uh different agency that work with seniors in different capacities. So we get referrals uh, from a lot of uh, places around the province as we are the only like um, seniors focused shelter uh, in the province. Um, we get a lot of referrals from our uh, hospitals. Um, they, it's uh, whether on uh, consultative like uh, approach or uh, a request uh, to discharge to our shelter due to uh, an eviction from a personal care home or people can lose their home for any reason end up in the hospital and then uh, we're being reached out to in order to figure out a solution uh, for all the others in order to find a place to stay and help them find a place after the shelter stay. Um, we also work with our hospitals through our housing team to help with the continuum of care post discharge. So some seniors um, would need to be discharged in the community, and we work with them in maintaining housing um, in the period after the hospital, as we found a lot of uh, cases that when people get discharged from the hospital due to their health needs uh, and other needs, um, they, they end up being homeless and losing their housing um, for various reasons. Um, this is out of the shelter, but we believe it maintains uh, housing when um, there's access to healthcare services uh, through case management and support. So our housing team worked very closely uh, post uh, shelter discharge with individuals in order to make sure that they are um, uh, safely housed and their their needs are being met uh, while in their housing. Um, and we have seen a lot of um, situations before that program existed of seniors deteriorating health-wise and end up being homeless, then the shelters start to act as um, uh, a healthcare facility, which we're not prepared to do, uh, and it ends up being in the hospital eventually. Um, so we do a lot of work in the community to maintain housing, but from a healthcare perspective in order to avoid the shelter stay or post-shelter stay in order to maintain the housing arrangement that the person uh, has secured. Uh, transportation is a big uh, piece of that work, uh, and it was actually one of the first services that we provided with the shelter. Um, we provide transportation for housing, health, finance, and food security reasons uh, to our shelter clients. So uh, people will be able to, uh, while they are arranging for their to move out of the shelter, uh, we try to access. Uh, the other services that will help them maintain the housing arrangement after they move out of the shelter. Um, we, we help securing a uh, family position. We we try to assign a pharmacy that will be close by. Um, sometimes there's regular appointments like dialysis and uh, cancer appointments that they don't qualify for any kind of medical transportation here, especially if they're over 65. And we work with them in order to make sure that they have access uh, to that service. Um, also, a reduction in ambulance calls. We sometimes uh, we we have had situations that seniors call the ambulance every second day and sometimes every day. And having a family doctor and having transportation that they know in the morning that they can go to the hospital or see a doctor that uh, will limit that kind of uh, uh, service usage. Um, the housing options that we have usually are between personal care homes, community care, long term care. And those are institutional housing arrangement uh, under our uh, Newfoundland Health Services. Uh, then it comes to the private market, which we saw a lot of shortage uh, uh, in the last couple of years. And also there's a, a lot of stigma around individuals that are being supported 
uh, by community agencies in general uh, with different age groups, uh, which let some of the big uh, housing providers, uh, private business housing providers, uh, turn away uh, seniors and others from from using or renting their properties. Um, so um, there's a lot of work now in the community uh, to try to look into affordable housing and other uh, form, forms of social housing uh, so individuals can avail from them. Um, precarious housing is something that we also see a lot with bed settings. Um, and it's something that we uh, try to advocate for as we, we are seeing a lot of seniors don't have a choice, especially when it comes to affordability, uh, than to live somewhere that is not um, adequate for their needs or their age or for anybody sometimes to be living in, um, in places that are precarious. We, we also try to work with families in order to um, bring people back to their home. So we had situations that people um, went out went out of the shelter back to their homes or with their family through mediation and uh, uh, family reconnection. Um, we find a lot of challenges to living independently. Um, um, in, in, in nutshell, their accessibility is a big piece of it. Uh, we have very limited accessible options in our city here and in the province overall. Uh, when things were built 50 years ago or 60 years ago, a lot of it, um, accessibility was not um, kept in mind um, for various reasons. But um, and now we started to think accessibility as a community and try to be age friendly city and age friendly province as we move forward. Um, personal care needs um, is a challenge uh, uh, when it comes to mental health behaviors and the shortage of personal care workers uh, here in the province. So we see it on, on too many levels. Um, it's a challenge in the shelter system as well. Uh, a lot of personal care agencies doesn't go into shelters uh, due to safety. And we try to um, uh, work with our healthcare system here in order to see how can we provide that service through the agency or the organization versus working uh, with a third party. Uh, and limit that liability. Um, I mean, uh, um, there's there's a lot of these challenges lead leads to uh, older adults being being homeless uh, and facing homelessness. Uh, and we have seen a lot of um, unsheltered situations because uh, of individuals cannot maintain their their household or the roof is leaking and they cannot live there anymore. Um, uh, the death of a partner and they cannot. Uh, um, uh, pay the mortgage anymore and so on. Um, there is uh, small needs uh, for like uh, medication reminders, uh, need for like uh, healthy meals. Uh, a lot of individuals are not used to uh, the reduction that happens in their income sometimes. And with the food costs going up, it's very difficult uh, to maintain uh, a balanced uh, nutritional uh, uh, meals, so it, it, it ends up being um, affecting their health, um, and we we work on that as well uh, to be able to connect them, uh, whether um, transportation for groceries or delivering meals to their homes, uh, and now we have um, like a meals on wheels kind of program that help them maintain their housing and receive meals at their home. Um, Mohammed, can I'll I interrupt for a minute? Sure. I, I just I had a question about um, the percentage of people that are fleeing violence that are in your like you're covering a it seems like quite a broad swath of people. Um, is it do you have a sense about what the percentage is of people who are fleeing violence? It's roughly about 20 percent. Yes. About 20 percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a it's it's a it's a it's a different form of violence uh, and, mm -hmm. and abuse in a yes. lot of the situations. And yes, it is. most of the time, there's no insight for that violence exists. So yeah. uh, um, a lot of a lot of it happens a lot from family members. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's related to finances most of the time as well. I would say 90% mm -hmm. of the time is financial related. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, about 85% of our clients are men. 
and actually about 80% in the community uh, in general that are facing homelessness in the community here are men. Uh, yeah. Men are overrepresented in the um, uh, homelessness uh, data yes. that we see. The structural uh, violence is an important part of the conversation, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah, for sure. Um, we see we see a lot of older adults um, um, that are currently hospitalized and occupying uh, acute care beds. Uh, they miss uh, the essential services in the community, um, and big part of it that again they don't have an inside self-reporting unit assessment doesn't always reflect what's really going on, and part of it is violence, and part of it is um, um, what is the real situation of what's going on. And again, the story I'm going to uh, share is going to be part of that, uh, elaborating on that a lot. Um, our goals is to look into uh, offering affordable housing. Uh, we we are now developing uh, like uh, 60 units affordable housing complex in order to be able to meet the big needs that we have in the community. Seniors in the community now are roughly about 35%. Uh, I mean, in the homelessness uh, community now, or uh, the individuals that are facing homelessness, it's reported to be about 35 to 40% sometimes, which is very high. Um, um, and we were we were successful last year to uh, secure some funding uh, in order to develop uh, uh, more affordable housing units. Um, we 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 partner with our um, uh, province and city. Three of us came together to offer supportive housing. Um, <clears throat> And um, um, uh, we were able to have 12 uh, individuals that have been housed for the last four years. Uh, we're looking now to expand on that because there's a very high demand uh, on that sort of housing. Uh, a lot of the supportive housing, actually, it's about, I would say, roughly about 50% of the individuals that are staying there escaped violence at some point and ended up with us. Mm -hmm. um, so staying staying in such a housing uh, unit, first of all, it helps with social isolation. So it eliminates the idea of them being alone uh, while anything, uh, any any sort of abuse or any sort of um, uh, violence happens. Uh, there's also yeah. uh, the the absence of um, uh, the, like the, the not being aware of their finances is something that we help to eliminate. So we we keep them on the top of their finances. We work with them in order to make sure that uh, they know what's going and what's going on. Uh, That's great. Maybe we can move back to the panel and um, like you've raised some really interesting uh, questions for me anyway, and uh, we can bring the discussion. Was there anything else that you wanted to add before we go back to the panel? Yep. Nope. That's actually that was the last one. Perfect. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thanks so much. It's no a problem. it's amazing when you have the uh, province and the municipality, um, you know, working with you. So this is uh, so I do want to I I do want this to be more of a dialogue. Um, you know, I I have questions. You know, I'm interested in this. You've been meeting as a group for a while now and expressed interest in coming together because your work is kind, you're kind of isolated in the work that you're doing. Why do you think it's important for us to have a forum like this? What do you, are we talking about what we should be talking about today? We're introducing people to the different models. I'm just interested in any thoughts you have about why this conference is important. Well, if I can go first, I think this um, this type of conference is really important to shine the light on the fact that there is elder abuse happening in our communities um, on a daily basis. It's it's very interesting to me when I talk to people about what I do or or what I'm passionate about, and people are, what do you mean that that happens? Yes, it does happen. Um, we need more presentations, we need more awareness, we need more buy-in in terms of collaboration with, with um, 
other agencies so that we can address some of these issues. I also see that we really have a changing landscape in Canada. Um, you know, and we're seeing that specifically at the shelter when it, in terms of elder abuse is that, um, you know, all types of different individuals from different countries, different cultures, different backgrounds, and, and really having to adapt in terms of language, in terms of um, practices, in terms of how we, how we run the shelter. Um, you know, we're always taking a look at, you know, we have people that don't speak English at all and, and trying to even find those um, um, interpreters to be able to converse with individuals is very difficult. Even if we only get a translator once a week to do the case management piece, this is daily living. And so the last thing in the world that you want to see is that people feel isolated because of their language or because of their own cultural practices and, and whatnot. So I, you know, for me and myself and, and our team here looking at those, um, you know, having those safe spaces for, for cultural activities, having those understanding and acceptance um, and that people feel welcome. You know, I, I do have to say that um, we have an individual here that, or had an individual that um, is illiterate and doesn't speak English at 70 years of age. And I thought that maybe she would feel more comfortable at the Muslim shelter here. After two weeks here, she said through translation, absolutely not. I love it here. And it's interesting to watch. It's, you know, with the other clients embracing um, individuals. And even if there's no language, we do a lot of hand movements. We do a lot of charades and can get the point across. And 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 these, this individual did feel comfortable. And so that's great. But I just, I think that the landscape is changing and we need to take a look at that and adapt. You know, I think, was it Carly or Tiffany or somebody said, adapting and being creative of, of how we deliver service and that continuity of care for our clients. That's thanks, my Marianne. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. Lisa? Yeah, for me, it's um, it's been a real learning experience to learn about all the different models that have happened across the country and to um, to know that it happens differently in different provinces. And so hoping that some provinces can build on the work of other provinces that are ahead and hoping that for those who are interested in um, setting up a, some kind of safe bed, the best advice I ever got it was just do it. Do it and figure it out as you go. And so, and I realized, you know, I did have a, a small grant to get started. Um, but even when that grant ran out, it was to continue to find a way to make it happen. So, so that would be my best advice is if you're interested and passionate and want to make this happen, then you can in your own communities and you'll do it in different ways in different parts of the province that you are in or, or different parts of the country um, because there's different networks of people out there that are all focused and interested in this area. Yeah, thanks. I heard that over and over again with the speakers, the sort of the the passion with which people are creative and working, you know, without really any kind of secure funding, but coming up with amazing solutions. It's it's really testimony to your commitment to the issues. Anyone else? I think too, it's important to remember that each area and province is different. So it's not a one size fits all model. We have to adapt and we have to listen to our clients. So if you're looking to start up a safe space for your clients, they are the experts. Listen to what they need in the community and what supports they need. I think that would be my biggest advice for anyone that's looking up to start a safe space. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, to just go off of what Tiffany mentioned is that it is unique based on provinces. We know all provinces are funded differently and prioritized differently. But having come together with this working group, really noticing that there are some themes and, and, and trends that we see across all provinces, the lack of resources, the increase in ch of challenges, and some of the, the creativity that has to come in play because of 
wanting to be adaptable to meet the needs of the individuals we serve. So that's kind of a piece as well, um, is just making sure we continue to be adaptable and continue to voice the need for more, more funding and supports for these services. Um, Charlie, I have a question for you. Uh, but Benedict, this was the time that we allowed, like that we created for um, people in the audience if they have questions, put them in your chat, put them in the Q&A and uh, Benedict will retrieve them. Uh, do, are there any questions, Benedict? For now, I'm not seeing any. I think people are probably just still kind of like taking it in and then typing. Yeah. So you have a couple more minutes to continue the conversation if you want while we collect them. Well, I particularly, Carly, I was interested in, you know, your model, uh, and I wondered, you know, are there lessons from the women's uh, movement, the shelter movement that, you know, I, I, I was very struck by what you're learning from working with older people in the, in the, in the shelter, but, you know, generally, are there lessons that we can take from the shelter movement? I think that there is a lot of, um, there's still a lot of stigma associated to violence against women. And yeah. really, especially as we're looking at different demographics who have had to just, you know, it's just the way it is. And that's how they were supposed to adapt within a marriage um, or a partnership is something we have to keep in mind uh, as well, because there is a lot of stigma and maybe not as many support. So with that in intergenerational um, component of intimate partner violence, their children may not be safe either. So there's this assumption that there's natural supports in place that they can turn to but those natural supports are just as unsafe as their partner is. So I think that that's a piece is to, to really recognize that. I think um, I've mentioned around the, the isolation. And even if they mm -hmm. have family, there is definitely isolation still in place because their family is not safe. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carly. Um, we do have a question that came in from Michelle, who is asking the group, when your spaces are full, in particular when it's due to lack of access, when there's a lack of access to other housing, um, where do people go who are in need of safety? So when you're keeping people longer, because you can't decently put them out in the streets, but they don't have housing to go to next, what happens for all the other people who are looking for a safe place to land? We have lots of difficult conversations. Um, at the, our agency, we try to maintain our time limit um, and try and find alternate safe space, even if it's a temporary housing, if it's just something we can think of as far as some form of subsidy, even if it's not ideal. Uh, we view it as somebody who has to come in. Um, it's around safety and the emergency of it. And so we really do try and keep to that time limit. And it is a lot of hard, difficult conversations we have to have. Anyone else from Anyone the group? Else? I can say from um, here at the Unison Elder Abuse Shelter, um, we do keep clients for a longer period of time. We find with our seniors, it's it's a lot, maybe a bit more difficult to, to move them in terms of um, their physical and, and medical needs, right? And so we will keep people on a on a longer term basis. And we also run the elder abuse resource line here out of the shelter. So we get many, many, many calls for shelter, but also just for those safe spaces. So we provide resources um, to those callers and follow up. We also have an elder abuse navigator through um, the Unison Senior Center. So we can navigate or hook those people up with a with a navigator to be able to um, help them in the community of Calgary. So if we do have to move clients on um, and there isn't necessarily an apartment for them to go to, it's trying to find a like doing a warm transfer and trying to find the best, like you were saying, Carly, um, the safe space in the community for them, whatever that looks like. Because it's unfortunate when we, we do have 14 beds, but with the housing crisis, people aren't moving through as quickly, so we could actually assist more. We're, we're getting there. We, we hope to get there soon. 
I, I also want to just acknowledge that how difficult that is for staff, right? When you, I think it's really important to acknowledge the people that are providing the service, providing the care. There's an impact on them too when you're not able to, um, you know, make a transition, keep a person in shelter. That needs to be part of this discussion and how do we protect the people who are doing the work as well. And that's a bit of a segue for me too. A few of you had stories. We only have a, we just have like, five minutes kind of thing but I you know I was interested how do how do you keep yourself up on it how do you what inspires you what are the stories that uh you know make you feel like this is all it, as hard as it is it's really worth doing no matter well, what the story is there's always success all right I can share yeah. Dan's story really quick but um, that I was going to talk about earlier. I'll do two minutes. So Dan's story is that he was at the shelter three times in two and a half years, um, returned to uh, family abuse uh, twice um, because of issues around immigration and the legalities that go around that. Um, third time came no more legalities, no more issues, and we're able to get him safely housed. And he is glowing, loving life. It's been about a year and I just can't even imagine. Okay, now I'm going to search cry. So anyways, it was just a really good feel good story that, you know, it, sometimes it takes a couple of times. Sometimes it takes seven times. Sometimes it takes 10 times. But you know, the, the fact that we're making a difference, even in that one starfish life, you know, um, it's really important. And so that's, I think, what keeps the people up around here and going, you know what, we're doing good work. Wonderful. Thanks, Marianne. Mohammed? Um, we, we have a saying here that if you're not nagging somebody, you're not doing your job. So we have to be the nagger. We cannot be the people that give up. <laughs> Um, we had a we had a we had a we had a senior that came through our door after two years of that we were just established in 2018. He was being evicted from personal care home about six or seven of them due to uh, aggression and behavior. Uh, he stayed with us for about four months. Within those four months, uh, he called the ambulance in one month over 23 times uh, due to not being able to stand up. Uh, we took him. He didn't have a family doctor. We found a family doctor. We got a referral. Um, I remember at the time I was doing the work myself and at the doctor's office, all his answers was out of pride. I have no problem. Uh, I, how many times do you fall? Nothing. I'm okay. Uh, after his consent, we explained to the doctor what's going on. He got admitted for two weeks. He got diagnosed with about 13 uh, conditions. Uh, half of them was neurological. I, I don't. I don't know how to say half of them. And he didn't see with one eye. He had Parkinson's, early stages of Parkinson's. He had early stages of dementia. And uh, the behaviors that were people talking about were just part of his condition. Um, he ended up in a higher level of care, uh, housed for the last five years. And we still visit him and say hi every holiday season. And when we tell people that, there's always a solution. It's just we need to know what the problem is. It's wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I just wanted to um, bring you the words of two people that have stayed at Pat's place. And when we asked um, them what that means to them, one person said at Pat's place, I could lock my door, have a shower, rest. It was so safe. This place gives you a home when you need it the most. For two months, everything was taken care of, furniture, basic necessities, and Pat's place staff would check on, in on me. I did a lot of thinking while I was there, heaven on earth. The second um, client said, thank you so much for giving me the chance to spend time on my own and the opportunity to find some of myself again. This is a creative idea for seniors and the one that has so much potential. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll just share one of our clients uh, really relates to having a safe space of actually saving their life, not necessarily because of the abuse, but because of the medical needs that they 
all the surgeries that were put on hold because they were unhoused, because they had to flee abuse. And so without us providing them that safe space, they weren't allowed to proceed with their surgeries that they needed to be able to maintain a fully livable life, how they wanted to live it. And so I think that there is this broader context too that we have to remember is that it's not always just about housing, but also medical care that goes along with being unhoused. So this person is now done all their surgeries, fully living their life and um, really working now on their goals and healing. So that's one of the pieces that helps us keep going with our knowing the work that we do. Thanks, Carly. We have a quick question from Mohammed uh, from the Q&A box that is asking, uh, what is your staffing contingency? Um, staffing um, has to be struggled between funding and uh, and actually needs. Um, it depends on the clientele we have in the shelter. Sometimes we can we can maneuver that and moving around. So sometimes we are doubling staff or tripling staff in certain situations. Uh, and sometimes when the shelter uh, doesn't seem to need uh, the high attention, especially overnight, uh, becomes a single staff for funding reasons. But for the new model that we're having, it's going to be double staff uh, all around the day, and that's our model that we. Uh, showed our government the need for it. So it's going to be, and we think that's very important to have, but funding can be very challenging, uh, especially with the overtimes and everything else uh, to have. Uh, so we have our support staff, we, we separate between supporting the shelter and the housing support. So this, these are two different things. So to stay in the shelter, you need support in place to make it as comfortable as possible. And in order to move out of the shelter, you need a different staffing model in order to help you moving out. So when I'm talking about single staff, I'm talking only about the support staff in the shelter. That's separate from the case management and the support that is in place. Uh, so th 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 these are two different areas that we differentiate between them when we talk about support. Thank you. Tiffany, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, so just a quick story about one of the clients that I worked with. It was one of my first clients about six years ago, and she came in with physical abuse from her alleged abuser client was able to go into our safe suite and breathe for their first time in years. She said, well, in her, our suite, she was able to realize how strong she is and how much resilience she has. Client was able to move into a safe space and is still living there today. She was able to start crafting again and she's attending local craft sales and selling her stuff and is just so happy to be able to reconnect with her grandchildren now that she's safe again. Thank you so much. Benedict, it's actually you that might get the final word. I was just going to thank people for, I've really enjoyed the panel. All yours. <laughs> yeah, I, I so appreciate uh, the different stories and the look into your world. And um, you've also stimulated other things that I think are worthy of discussion. You know, I'm interested in the reduced ambulance calls impact, you know, and I think in ongoing conversations, maybe we could talk a little more about the kinds of implications for communities, you know, in supporting older people who are fleeing violence or other kinds of structural violence that are in there, you know, that are so common. So thank you so much, everyone, for this panel. And uh, we will continue the discussion and the thinking. And uh, I think we're going to take how long of a break, Benedict? Uh, we have uh, 15 minutes. We've been extending the breaks between sessions so people have more time for more snacks. Um, so we'll see you all in 15 minutes for our, the last session of the day. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much. Thanks, everyone.